Aleph, Bet, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Vav, Sein, Chet, Tet, Yud, Kaf, Chaf, Lamed, Men, Nun, Samech, Ein, Pei, Fet, Sadi, Kuf, Reish, Shun, Sin, Tav, Now I think I've said enough. Welcome to another in our series from the Aleph Bet, a series for anyone of any age who wishes to learn how to read and understand Hebrew, especially the Hebrew that's used in the experience of Judaism here in the United States. I'm Mark Golub. It's so nice to be with you again. Thank you for the lovely emails you keep sending me. I received a lovely email from a, an adult who studies with his older father which is a big kick for me to, to understand how there are people of all generations sitting together learning Hebrew. And now that this is the second in our series, really learning now how to read parts of the Jewish tradition in Hebrew and to understand Hebrew. And I remember as a child how different my experience was. Um, I remember sitting in a Talmud Torah class and the whole goal was to see how fast we could read the Viahavta prayer, the prayer that is part of the Shema. And I would remember, I would be sitting at, at my desk and, you know, Jimmy would be asked to read and I'd follow along and I'd see if by the end of a minute, we were normally given 60 seconds, at the end of a minute, you know, where would I be in the uh, paragraph? And hopefully when it came my turn, I could read the fastest in the class. It had nothing to do with understanding. It had only to do with reading as quickly as possible. And incidentally, there is some value to that because ultimately the paragraph became easy for me to read in the sense of pronouncing. It became mine in terms of the ear, in terms of the mouth, in terms of the language. But it would have been nice for me to have some sense of what the words meant and what I was really saying as I read the Viahavta, this magnificent passage that comes from the Torah, the five books of Moses. And I recognize that when I was 10, 11, 12, even 13, I might not have appreciated the words as I do as an adult, but it would have been nice to, to have been given some sense of what I was reading. And here on From the Olive Bet, we're now going to look at passages and blessings and and other parts of the liturgy, other parts of Jewish experience, the four questions, so that when they are said, and hopefully you'll be able to read them smoothly and easily, you'll also have a real sense of what you're saying as you're using that Hebrew. We're beginning with the aspect of Hebrew that is primary. I mean by that when we go to experience Judaism, the very first thing we do is learn Hebrew or Jewish blessings. And I mentioned last time that in the Jewish tradition, there's this notion that the Jew looks everywhere in life for opportunities to, to recite or to say blessings so that we always appreciate life, never end up taking it for granted. One of the things a blessing does is force us to appreciate what we have. And in the Jewish tradition, there is a blessing for virtually everything that we do in life. And if you look at the liturgy, it even shows how a Jew gets up in the morning and what a Jew does in terms of washing. And there's a blessing for washing one's hands. There's a blessing even in the Jewish tradition for going to the bathroom. There is no, no sense in the Jewish tradition that something is dirty or something should be set aside. In the Jewish tradition, there's this lovely blessing where we thank God for the fact that we have orifices, we have openings that work. And it's interesting, if there are any of you watching who've ever had a problem in this regard, you know not only is it, can it, it can be terribly painful, but it can be life-threatening. And yet, it's one of the bodily functions we take for granted. The Jewish tradition doesn't want us to take life for granted. One of the ways it helps us is by telling us to recite a blessing over everything we eat and drink and see and hear. The goal in the Jewish tradition, it's, it's a um, 
symbolic goal, but the goal is to try to find the opportunity to recite 100 blessings every day over everything one sees, hears, eats, and drinks. In fact, I think the only thing that a human being does that does not have a blessing in the Jewish tradition, it's very interesting, we'll talk about that uh, this at a different time, but it has to do with sexuality. When human beings involve in expressions of love, they don't have to worry about saying a blessing to God. They're too involved with each other. But in general, everything we do has a blessing. And so that's where we want to begin. We want to begin with what, how do you pronounce Hebrew blessings, Jewish blessings, and how, and, and how do you understand what do they mean? And we began by showing you a couple of words that start virtually every Jewish or Hebrew blessing. And we're going to put those three words up on the screen for you right now. Thank you, Sloan. And let's take them one by one. And we're going to begin with the second word. The word is ata. A two-syllable word, two vowels, two syllables. A is the first syllable. Ta is the second. It is the second person subjective pronoun. It is the word that means you. Here's the word for I. Ani. And this is the word for you. Ata. So ata is simply the word in Hebrew for you. And then we took a look at this three-letter root. Bet, resh, chaf. And do you remember that any time you see these three letters in this order, in a word, as the three-letter root, it has something to do with blessing. Very good, blessing. And I also showed you last time something so interesting that the word blessing, which in Hebrew is this word here, two vowels, two syllables. The first syllable is bera. The shva under the bet comes under the first letter of a word and under a letter with a dagesh. So the shva is pronounced i, as in the word fish, even though it is not counted as a vowel. So the first syllable in this word is bira, and the second syllable, cha, mitsuyan, put the word together, you get bracha, mitsuyan, and bracha is the Hebrew word for a blessing. And here you see a child being blessed, a blessing. But if we change the vowels in this word, keep the three-letter root, but change the vowels as you see them now on the screen, the word is no longer bracha, but it is brecha, mitsuyan, brecha. And we learned that brecha is a pool of water or a pond because the root of bet reishchaf comes ultimately in ancient Hebrew from the word for well, water. Because in the ancient Near East, actually in the Middle East in general, any place that one lives in a desert, water is of course the source of all life, and therefore water is a blessing. And so we have a sense that indeed the idea of blessing in Hebrew comes from the words for life giving source. The word therefore brecha and bracha are related. And here we see on the screen a two vowel, two syllable word. Can you pronounce this two syllable word? Ba is the first syllable. Ruch is the second syllable. Baruch, mitsuyan. And Baruch is the past participle of the verb. It is blessed. And we showed you last time that if you put Ata Baruch together, you get the notion of you are blessed. And the sense of blessing here is you are the one who gives life and blessing because of the giving of life. 
And in Hebrew, the syntax tends to be verb in front of pronoun. And therefore, although in English we might say, Ata Baruch, you are blessed, in Hebrew it becomes Baruch Ata. And virtually every Hebrew Jewish blessing begins with these two words, Baruch Ata. And then the question is, who is the you being blessed? And the answer is the God of the children of Israel. And the God of the children of Israel has a name. And here you see God's proper name, yud Hey vav Hey. And we learned that when the rabbis write God's name, they write an abbreviation taking the first letter of God's name, the Yud, doubling it. And therefore, the double Yud stands for God's proper name. And I don't mean this to be irreverent in any sense. When I'm teaching young people, I try to say this because it's a little bit cute and they understand better what I'm saying. Let's suppose there's a God named Irving. Let's suppose the God of the children of Israel is Irving. And if you don't want it to be a male's name, it could be Sadie. So, in essence, the double Yud stands for God's name, which could be Irving. It isn't. It's yud heh vav We don't know how to pronounce it. But what the blessing says when it says, Baruch Ata, and then the double Yud is, You are blessed, Irving, or Sadie. You are the source of all our blessing and our life. Baruch Ata, and then instead of saying Irving or Sadie or God's name, we say my Lord or our Lord or O Lord, and we pronounce it Adonai. And therefore the first three words of virtually every Jewish blessing are Baruch Ata Adonai. Translated often in the prayer book, Blessed art thou, Adonai, or Blessed art thou, O Lord. And because the double Yud stands for God's proper name, yud heh vav Hey, and because yud heh vav Hey is our God, the next word in the blessing is this word you see on the screen. How many vowels in this word? If you said three, you are correct. The cholom for the lamid, the tsere for the hey, the shuruk for the nun, and under the aleph is not a vowel, even though it's pronounced as if it were a segol, but it is a shva with a segol next to it. Formerly it's called a chataf segol. But a shva is never counted as a vowel, even when a vowel sound is placed next to it to give it some body, some sound. And therefore the first syllable only has one vowel, the cholom for the lamed, and the syllable is elo, mitsuyan, elo. And if there's somebody who says elo, it's okay. But if you want to understand the Hebrew, it's elo. And every pronounced shva, as is true of the shva under the aleph, is pronounced as a grace note in Hebrew. So it would not be elo, but elo. That's the first syllable. The second syllable is easy. The hey with a tsere, hey, and you'll notice the vertical line next to the tsere that tells you where to accent the word. And the accent mark is not placed in any word where the accent is normally on the last syllable. Most Hebrew words are always accented on the last syllable, but when a Hebrew word is not accented on a last syllable, this vertical line next to the tsere under the hey tells us where to accent this word. And the third syllable is simply nu, mitsuyan. And I think many of you will remember that nu is also a suffix that represents the possessive pronoun, first person plural, our. And the word is pronounced in three syllables as Eloheinu, mitsuyan. Elo Heinu, and it means our God. Because Yud Hey Vav Hey, represented by the double Yud, is 
our God. Remember, the word for God is Elohim. By dropping the final mem and adding the new as a suffix, it becomes our God. And now we have the first four words of virtually every Jewish Hebrew blessing. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu, which means you are blessed, Adonai yud heh our God. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu, blessed art thou, O Lord, our God. And again, remember, O Lord is simply what we say instead of God's proper name. What this really says is, you are blessed, the source of all blessing, water, life, Irving, our God. Except it's not Irving, it's yod Hey vav Hey, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu. And those are the first four words that begin virtually every Hebrew Jewish blessing. Two more words. First of all, here's a word you know from our first series. Two vowels, two syllables. A word you should be able to now see and read immediately. Melech, Mitsuyan. And you see that the first segol has the vertical line next to it, telling us that the word is accented on the first syllable. And all Hebrew words with vowels segol, segol, under the first two letters, those words are always accented on the first syllable. So the word is melech. And the word melech means, yes, you see the picture here, it means king. Mitsuyan, melech, king. And then this wonderful word you see on the screen right now, a three vowel, three syllable word. The first syllable is, very easy, a hey with a kamat, ha, mitsuyan. And many of you will remember that ha as a prefix in front of a noun means the. It's the definite article in Hebrew. And now we have a noun. Two vowels, two syllables. The first syllable is o, mitsuyan, the ayin is silent followed by a cholam, O, and the last syllable, Lam, Mitsuyan. Put the word together and you get Ha-O-Lam. And Ha-O-Lam is a wonderful, wonderful word because Olam is one of the great Hebrew words. There's no word like it in English. Look at the root of the word Olam. The three-letter root is Ayin, Lamed Mem. And whenever you see Ayin Lamed Mem as the root, it has something to do with the infinite, with infinity. When it comes to time, what is infinite time? Eternity, Mitsuyan, forever. And therefore, if you see this word, with a lamed in front of olam, le olam, it means to eternity. The le in Hebrew is the prefix to or for. Le olam is to eternity. And very often you will hear it translated as forever. But it comes from the root infinity, infinite. And for me, when I understand that le'olam has the sense of infinite in terms of time, and one says that something will be le'olam forever doesn't capture for me the sense of the Hebrew where it's on into the future forever and ever and ever, infinite time. And as a noun, infinite means everything, ultimate, more than we can even imagine. We use the word universe in the English. Sometimes you hear the word world, but it's world in the sense of everything that possibly could be. And therefore, ha-olam, where olam now is a noun representing substance, 
therefore infinite substance, infinite everything, eternity, Ha'olam is the universe. And if you put these two words together, Melech Ha'olam, it is king or sovereign of everything that exists in the universe. And when it comes to using Melech to refer to God, and very often we get hung up about male and female, if you look at the Hebrew, it has nothing to do with male and female, because the root of the word melech is mem lamed chaf, which has something to do with ruling and sovereignty. And what, therefore, a better picture in our mind for melech, especially as it applies to Jewish blessings, is this simple crown and scepter, the symbol of sovereignty and ruling. And for me, if you put these two pictures together, the picture for sovereignty on top of the picture for the universe, you understand that Melech HaOlam means that yud Hey vav Hey, the source of all blessing and life, is also in some way the sovereign of the entire universe of all that is. And that's what the Hebrew was trying to explain. Not that there is a male king in heaven who sits on top of the universe. The Jewish tradition never is that anthropomorphic. Hebrew language itself is by its very nature anthropomorphic. It talks about things as if they are human beings, people, he's and she's. We call ships she's. People love cars, call cars she's. A car is an inanimate object. It's not a he or a she. And when the Jewish tradition talks about God, it has no sexual reference whatsoever. It's not a he or a she. And the word melech, if it's understood in this Hebraic sense of the sovereign, of the olam, it has nothing to do with gender. And therefore, what the first words of every Jewish Hebrew blessing are Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam translated simply as Blessed are you Yud Hey Vav Hey Our God Adonai Our God Melech HaOlam the sovereign of everything that is and the prayer book often translated as Blessed art thou Adonai, our God, or our Lord, our God, we use Adonai, king of the universe. But if you understand the Hebrew, it is a much more profound statement. Baruch ta Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. It can even give one chills if one understands what the Hebrew is saying as opposed to simply reading a prayer book English translation. And those are the words which begin virtually every Hebrew blessing. I say virtually. There are some that are even shorter. Some blessings even have a shorter open. But that's basically the short open for Hebrew Jewish blessings. And now I want to take the rest of one of the most basic Hebrew blessings and show you how it reads. It's a blessing I believe many of you will know. But so far you've got Baruch Atad Onai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Incidentally, I'm pronouncing this in a Sephardic way. Many of you grew up in Ashkenazic homes. You hear these words differently. Very often you'll hear HaOlam said in very many ways. HaOlam. Melech HaOlam. Is that wrong? If it's said by one who understands it's a blessing, and that's how he heard it from his grandparents and his parents, he says, Boru, Ato, Adonai, Eloheinu Melcholam. Is it wrong? No, it's not wrong. Is it pure Sephardic Hebrew? No. Is it wrong? No. I'm teaching you here Sephardic Hebrew pronunciation. The word is not Holam or Holam. No, it's Ha'olam, Melech Ha'olam. And having said that, I'd love you to know it. You say it any way you wish. 
as long as at the same time you now have a greater appreciation for what this means and what you are saying and what you're expressing for yourself. So now let's take a look at this Hebrew root. It's one we've done before in the first series of From the Aleph Bet, and it is Bet Resh Aleph. And any time you see Bet Resh Aleph, it has something to do with creating, creating. And we're going to put the following vowels in this three-letter root. A holom after the Bet, and a Tzere under the Resh. And lo and behold, the word is pronounced as a two-vowel, therefore two-syllable word. Very simple. Bo re. And you already know that bo re comes from the Hebrew root bet resh aleph, has something to do with creating. And although I'm going to do this in more detail later on, let me just tell you here that anytime you see in a verbal form the holom after the first root letter, it tells you the root has become a noun, and the one who does whatever the root of the verb is about. So the word bore is one who creates. Mitsuyan, one who creates. And sometimes I show young people that the holom can even be visualized as the number one. One who creates. Bore. Or creator. Same translation. One who creates and creator, same idea. And here you see, and I, I picked two kinds of creators, the artist who paints and the sculptor who creates with the chisel. But a bore is someone who creates, and it can be any kind of creation. You build a bridge, you're a bore. And if you in some way contribute to this world, you are a bore. And the ultimate bore in the Jewish tradition is yud heh vav -He, who is not only the wellspring of blessing, of life, but is also the energy that pulses through, that runs through the entire universe. And therefore, in the Jewish tradition, yud heh vav -He is, un is understood to be the ultimate bore. And in the Jewish tradition, to be like God, to be created in the image of God, in the Jewish tradition, has nothing to do with what we look like God. How silly would that be? It's not about looking like God or that God looks like human beings. It's that we have the capacity to be the essential reflection of God. And the Jewish tradition teaches the ultimate reflection of God is for human beings to be creative. Anytime a human being is a bore, one is living in the image of God. That's what the Jewish tradition says. To be a creative person in any way at all, anytime one uplifts this world, in some way builds a life for another human being, it's not simply building bridges or painting pictures or sculpting sculptures. To be creative is to do anything that in some way upbuilds this world and one's fellow man and woman. That is to be a bore, and that is to be in the image of God. And so God is the ultimate bore from the Hebrew root, bet, resh, aleph. And then we have a phrase you learned already in our first series of programs when we learned the Hebrew letter pe. Here's this two word phrase. Can you read it and do you remember what it means? The first word has only one vowel, the hirik under the resh. Please remember a shva is never counted as a vowel and the word is pri, mitsuyan, pri. And the second word is a three vowel word. Notice that the he at the beginning of the word means the, ha, and the rest of the word is gafen, gafen. And the vertical line under the gimel next to the kamats tells us to accent the ga in the word gafen. And therefore the two-word phrase is 
Prihagafen, Mitsuyan. And I hope you all remember that Prihagafen means fruit of the vine and refers most specifically to grapes that are turned into wine. And therefore the phrase Bore Prihagafen, creator of the fruit of the vine, or in essence, creator of wine, and wine in the Jewish tradition is a symbol of joy. At every happy occasion, one fills a Kiddush cup with wine, one lifts the Kiddush cup and says, a bore. By the way, blessings in Hebrew are called by the first unique word in the blessing. And since all the words leading up to the word bore are the words that are in every blessing, and since the word bore is the first unique word of this blessing, this blessing is called the bore. And the bore is a blessing over wine as a symbol of joy in the Jewish tradition. And any time there is a joyous occasion, the Jewish family fills a cup of wine, lifts it up, and says this bracha, this blessing. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, bore pri hagafen. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, bore pri hagafen. And in English, Blessed art thou, Adonai our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. And this is the first blessing I'm happy to teach you in a way that you can not only read and pronounce, but read and understand. Baruch ata Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, borei pri hagafen. Blessed art thou, Adonai, yud heh vav -Hey, our God, sovereign of all that is, the one who creates the fruit of the vine that we bless in joy at every joyous moment. And that's our lesson for this week, a lesson that hopefully will teach you not only to read and recite a Hebrew blessing, a Jewish blessing, but also have a real sense of what it means. And as we go forward, we're going to take other blessings Make sure you can recite, again, some of the most well-known, famous, and often used blessings in the Jewish tradition. And we'll go from there to more complicated aspects of Jewish life, Jewish liturgy, as I hope you stay with us for our series, Series 2, in From the Aleph Bet. I hope you enjoyed that lesson of From the Aleph Bet, and remember, you can download lesson sheets and worksheets for every lesson of this series free of charge. Just visit the JBS website homepage at jbstv.org and click on the program icon for From the Aleph Bet. And then click on the very first option, From the Aleph Bet Hebrew Study Sheets. And for anyone who can send JBS, a tax-deductible donation of $180 or more will be pleased to send you the entire 20-program Series 1 of From the Aleph Bet on DVD, complete with a CD of lesson sheets and worksheets. JBS, expanding Jewish understanding, celebrating all things Jewish. Be well, my friends. Aleph, bet, bet, gimel, dalet, hey, vav, sein, chet, tet, yud, kaf, chaf, lamed, mad.